The hyla are a bridge that connect the lungs with the heart and mediastinum. The bronchi, pulmonary arteries, pulmonary veins, and hyalur lymph nodes make up the hyla. These structures are individually distinguishable on enhanced chest CTs, but form a composite opacity on frontal chest x-rays. On lateral chest x-rays, the right and left hyla form an upside-down horseshoe. The right pulmonary artery forms the anterior portion of the horseshoe, here in red, and the left pulmonary artery forms the superior and posterior portions of the horseshoe, here in yellow. The left upper below bronchus, in blue on this image, is visible as a dark oval in the middle of the horseshoe. In patients with bulky subcranial lymphadenopathy, an opacity, which I've drawn in green here, may appear immediately inferior to the left upper lobe bronchus and create a complete fat ring around the left upper lobe bronchus, resulting in what some folks call a bagel sign. There are four types of hyalur disorders you may encounter on imaging. Hyalur enlargement, which can be detected on chest x-ray or CT. Hyalur shift, which can also be seen on chest x-ray or CT. And bronchial disorders, which are directly visible on CT and occasionally inferable on chest x-ray when, say, an endobronchial occlusion results in obstructive atelectasis. And endovascular disorders, usually involving the pulmonary arteries. So there are four different ways hyalur disorders may present on imaging as enlargement, as superior or inferior shift, as an endobronchial process, or as an endovascular process. Let's begin with disorders that present as hyalur enlargement. The hyalur are composed of three structures, airways, pulmonary vessels, and lymph nodes. And any of these can cause hyalur enlargement. Bronchogenic cancers from the airways can cause hyalur enlargement. Pulmonary hypertension and shunt vascularity can cause hyalur enlargement. Lymphadenopathy can also cause hyalur enlargement. The most common bronchogenic cancers resulting in hyalur enlargement are the three types of lung cancer that are most commonly central in location, small cell carcinomas, squamous cell carcinomas, and bronchial carcinoids, like this example here. Because uh, synchronous primary lung cancers are uncommon, the hyalur enlargement is usually unilateral in these cases. Um, you can see here, left hyalur enlargement caused by a bronchial carcinoid tumor, uh, which also happens to be causing obstructive atelectasis of the left upper lobe. Hyalur enlargement can also be of vascular origin, and the most common vascular cause is pulmonary arterial hypertension. When I see pulmonary arterial enlargement and am thinking about invoking pulmonary arterial hypertension, I usually try to figure out what the cause might be. And I resort to this 2 by 2 chart I first learned in medical school to help me remember the top eight causes of pulmonary hypertension. Two pulmonary vascular disorders, two lung parenchymal disorders, two cardiac disorders, and two disorders in obese patients. Chronic PE and primary pulmonary hypertension are the two vascular disorders. COPD and interstitial lung disease are the two parenchymal disorders. Mitral valvular disease and left to right shunts are the two cardiac disorders. Sleep apnea and drug toxicity are the disorders related to obesity. The reason why uh, medical students from the 1990s like me um, categorized drug toxicity under obesity was because of a popular weight loss drug of the era named Fenfen that received widespread national attention for causing fatal pulmonary hypertension in people. A less common vascular cause of hyalur enlargement is shunt vascularity. Shunt vascularity occurs when the pulmonary vasculature is diffusely increased in size due to an increase in pulmonary vascular flow caused by a left to right shunt, like an ASD, PDA, or VSD. Or cyanotic heart disorders, such as truncus arteriosus, transposition of the great vessels, and total anomalous pulmonary venous return that mix deoxygenated systemic venous blood with oxygenated pulmonary venous blood that drive a compensatory increase in pulmonary vascular flow. Shunt vascularity can sometimes be tricky to differentiate from pulmonary arterial hypertension on chest x-rays, but 
One helpful hint or tip is to look at the peripheral pulmonary vessels. In pulmonary hypertension, the hilar vessels are enlarged, but the pulmonary, the peripheral vessels are normal or small. Um, people refer to this as pruning. In shunt vascularity, however, the hilar vessels are enlarged and the peripheral vessels are enlarged too. Lymphadenopathy is the final reason why the hyla may be enlarged. We're going to take the table of top lymphadenopathy causes from our middle mediastinal uh, talk and add a unilateral bilateral axis to get this table. So we'll think of lymphoma regardless if the hyalur enlargement due to lymphadenopathy is unilateral or benign. With unilateral hyalur enlargement due to lymphadenopathy, we'll also consider things like lung cancer and tuberculosis, while with bilateral hyalur enlargement due to lymphadenopathy, we'll favor things like extrathoracic malignancy spread to the hyalur lymph nodes, sarcoidosis, histoplasmosis, and pneumoconiosis in addition to lymphoma. Um, this is an example of unilateral lymphadenopathy in the setting of lung adenocarcinoma. And this is a different example um, of unilateral right hyalur lymphadenopathy in the setting of metastatic parotid cancer. Diseases like sarcoidosis, on the other hand, tend to present bilaterally when lymphadenopathy occurs, often involving both hyla, in addition to um, classically the right paratracheal station in the mediastinum. Because shunt vascularity is pretty uncommon, when I see hyalur enlargement on a chest x-ray or a chest CT, I usually think about the three main elements of the hyla, airways, pulmonary vessels, and lymph nodes, and use that list to remind me of my differential diagnosis for hyalur enlargement, bronchogenic cancer, pulmonary hypertension, and lymphadenopathy. It's usually pretty trivial to tell these things, three things apart uh, from each other on CT, though not always quite so easy on chest x-ray. Uh, folks uh, traditionally taught us to use the Hyler conversion sign to distinguish cases of pulmonary hypertension from masses like a bronchogenic cancer or lymphadenopathy on chest x-ray, though in the real world, I tend to find the sign sort of lacking in both specificity and sensitivity. Now, let's move on to hyalur shift. The hyla can shift either superiorly or inferiorly because of regional upper or regional lower lung volume loss in the setting of disorders like atelectasis or fibrosis and uh, man-made ones such as a lobectomy. Upper lobe atelectasis tends to drag the hyla superiorly while middle and lower lobar atelectasis tend to drag the hyla inferiorly. Adelectatic causes of hyalur shift tend to be disorders that may obstruct a lobar bronchus. Things like central neoplasms, broncholifts, foreign bodies, and mucus plugs. This in ex here is an example where right middle lobe atelectasis has dragged the right hilum inferiorly, which I'm pointing with uh, orange uh, arrow here. Um, this is a different um, case, which we actually saw a few um, slides ago, where left upper lobar atelectasis has dragged the left hilum superiorly. Fibrosis, um, just like atelectasis, can also result in upper or lower lung volume loss that can drag the hyla up or down. The most common causes of regional lung fibrosis that can do this are things like radiation fibrosis, tuberculosis, non-tubercular mycobacterial infections, um, endemic fungal infections, sarcoid and pneumoconioses. Um, this is an example of bilateral um, hyalur shift upwards in the, in the setting of silicosis. Um, here's a different case of bilateral superior hyalur shift um, in the context of tuberculosis. Um, just look at how superiorly um, the right main stem um, bronchus bifurcation is on this image. Finally, um, 
regional lung volume loss um, causing hyalur shift can sometimes be man-made. And a nice example of that is with um, lobectomies. On this patient, post right upper lobectomy, you can see how the right hilum, which I'm pointing to with an orange arrow here, has shifted upwards compared to the left hilum, which I point to here with the right arrow. Okay, that's hilar shift. Now let's talk about endobronchial disorders. Endobronchial disorders may be focal or segmental. And the four most common focal endobronchial disorders are mucus plugs, endobronchial neoplasms, bronchial lifts, and foreign bodies. Mucus plugging is an uncommon in patients and usually presents as a fluid attenuation endobronchial opacity. Some mucus plugs are intermittently occlusive with air filled lung peripherally, while others are persistently occlusive and can cause um, obstructive atelectasis. Um, with upper lobe bronchi, the ipsilateral hilum will shift upwards as the upper lobe collapses, while with right middle lobe and uh, other lower lobe um, bronchi, um, the ipsilateral hyla will shift downwards as the lower or middle lobe collapses. Um, this case here is an example of a right middle lobe mucus plug that's fluid attenuation associated with right middle lobar obstructive atelectasis. Um, here's an another example of a patient with a right middle lobar atelectasis due to a mucus plug. And you can see where the white arrow is, where you would expect to see a right hilum, there's nothing because the right hilum, which is what I'm pointing to with the orange arrow here, has actually shifted substantially inferiorly. Obstructive atelectasis is uh, one consequence of persistent mucus plugging. Post-obstructive uh, post pneumonia is another. Endobronchial neoplasms. Um, endobronchial neoplasms are another focal endobronchial disorder. Some are benign, like um, endobronchial papillomas and hamartomas. Um, Carindromas are also benign, but much more rare. Um, some other uh, endobronchial neoplasms are malignant. Uh, we encountered three of these malignant neoplasms during our tracheal talk, and there's a fourth one on this list um, that's more uh, particular to uh, bronchi, not trachea. Um, those are bronchial carcinoids. Um, here's an example of a benign endobronchial hamartoma in the left mainstem bronchus. Um, these will usually be silent on chest x-ray until they've become large enough to obstruct the bronchus and become symptomatic. Um, some endobronchial hamartomas may contain fat and calcification and therefore present specifically, while others, like this one, will just look soft tissue and density through and through and be indistinguishable, indistinguishable um, from a mucus glob or an isoattenuating organic form body like a pea or a peanut. Um, this is a case with a different endobronchial tumor. Um, this one's an endobronchial carcinoid. Uh, however, like um, hamartomas, carcinoids can also be silent on chest x-ray until they finally become large enough to obstruct the airway and then become symptomatic. Carcinoids are generally hyper-enhancing. They're also known to be to partially calcify sometimes. So be cautious if the calcification pattern you see in an endobronchial nodule is one of your indeterminate calcification patterns. This, um, as opposed to our next focal endobronchial disorder, broncholifts. Broncholifts will appear as a benign, completely uniformly calcified endobronchial nodule. Um, benign pattern. Broncholifts usually occur when a calcified hyalur lymph node slowly erodes through the wall of an airway and ends up within its lumen. Broncholifts generally occur most often in folks with histo and tuberculosis. Finally, the fourth focal endobronchial disorder to be familiar with are foreign bodies, uh, like this example of a molar sitting in a patient's left mainstem bronchus. The majority of endobronchial foreign bodies end up in the right or left mainstem bronchus and can be associated with a number of different types of complications. Um, partially occlusive ones may be associated with distal air trapping, while others can lead to obstructive atelectasis or post-obstructive pneumonia, like in this particular patient. 
chronic endobronchial foreign bodies can also uh, lead to things like bronchiectasis too. Um, this is the chest x-ray of the patient we just saw on the last few slides, and you can actually see the molar on this image, which even contains uh, what looks like either a dental crown or a filling. So those um, are the top four focal endobronchial disorders. Um, there are three segmental endobronchial disorders I'd also like you to be familiar with. Bronchomalacia, bronchial strictures, and GPA. Bronchomalacia occurs in folks with weakened cartilage within the wall of their central airways. Um, this can be observed quite dramatically sometimes um, as dynamic collapse during expiratory phase imaging. Trauma, chronic inflammation are common causes, and it's also something we sometimes see in lung transplant patients. GPA, or what we used to call Wegner's, is a cause of bronchial structures to also be familiar with. Although less common um, than the lung parenchymal presentation of Wegner's, um, um, the endobronchial presentation of uh, Wegner's or GPA uh, can sometimes lead to quite significant central airway occlusion that can be life-threatening in some patients. Now, let's finish with the fourth and final category of hyalur disorder, the endovascular ones. In this case, we're talking about PE, tumor emboli, and the rare pulmonary arterial sarcoma. Acute PEs are the most common disorder of these three by far. Central PEs that appear in the central hyalur pulmonaries are usually trivial to identify if you're reading in a contrast-enhanced chest CT. However, you'll need to be comfortable distinguishing acute from chronic central PEs. Acute PEs generally are usually found in normal diameter or even dilated pulmonary arteries because the clot is impacted within the vessel lumen. Acute PEs tend to have acute angles with the vessel wall, like on this image, and may be surrounded by a thin crescent of contrast, like on the left side on this image. Chronic PEs, on the other hand, tend to be associated with reduced vessel diameter due to the contraction of the thrombus with time. Um, other features of chronic PEs uh, include uh, endovascular bands, uh, webs, um, abrupt vessel narrowing, and intimal irregularities. In some central chronic PEs, you may also notice enlarged serpiginous bronchial arteries too. If you've read head CTs, um, you may be familiar with um, the hyperdense MCA sign in the setting of an MCA um, clot. A correlate um, exists on non-contrast chest CT2. Sometimes um, central pulmonary, pulmonary emboli um, may be visible on non-contrast CT as a heterogeneous region of endovascular hyperattenuation. The cause, just like with hyperdense MCA sign, is due to an, the increased relative concentration of hemoglobin, hemoglobin to water as a thrombus begins to retract. And here's um, the PE protocol chest CT we did in this patient um, to confirm our suspicion of central PE on non-contrast imaging on the last slide. Central tumor emboli. Um, these are relatively uncommon and can be tricky to distinguish from commonplace bland uh, pulmonary emboli. However, uh, two imaging features um, that may um, suggest um, that you're dealing with tumor emboli um, are filling defects that don't seem to regress or retract on follow-up imaging and um, obvious enhancement within the endovascular filling defect. And that leads us to um, another rare endovascular disorder, pulmonary arterial sarcomas. Um, pulmonary arterial sarcomas are unusually fatal, are, on, are unfortunately fatal um, in most cases um, and insidious uh, in their presentation. And that completes our review of Hyler disorders.